So the next topic was an FDA pooled analysis looking at a bunch of studies over the last several years that have looked at and included patients with high tumor PDL1 uh, staining on their tumors. So predictive of a good response to immunotherapy, though certainly not a sure thing, uh, over 50% or 50% or higher. And uh, this is about 30%, 28 to 30% of patients. And the FDA looked at their pooled results for patients in various trials that either gave these patients immunotherapy, the IO stands for immuno-oncology. So that's just an abbreviation that we use for those following at home. Um, immunotherapy alone, which is an FDA approved and very appropriate possible standard of care. There's data showing it's clearly superior to chemotherapy as the first treatment for advanced non-small cell in patients who don't have a driver mutation like EGFR or ALK. And other patients who got chemotherapy combined with immunotherapy, which is another essentially competing standard of care. So this is uh, an area where there's judgment and sane, thoughtful people can recommend to patients that they might do immunotherapy uh, alone. Uh, and others would say you should do chemo with a standard two drug combination plus immunotherapy. Uh, there's various regimens and among the most common are chemo with Keytruda, pembrolizumab, but, but there's a few others. And the results are uh, what's shown here. The median, I'll just remind folks, is the point where half the patients are alive and half have, have died or half have progressed and half have not. And ORR is response rate, the proportion with major tumor shrinkage as defined by precise measurements on scans. And you can see <laughs> that in this <clears throat> pooled analysis, immunotherapy alone was uh, modestly less effective than chemo combined with immunotherapy. And in fact, there was a significant better result with chemo added to immunotherapy in terms of the proportion with significant shrinkage, 43% versus 61%. These are both very good numbers compared to what we used to get with chemo alone, which was typically about 25 or 30% on a very good day. Uh, Median progression-free survival of 7.1 versus 9.6 months. This was also significantly favoring the, the group uh, with chemoimmunotherapy. And though the numbers are better uh, for median overall survival with chemoimmunotherapy versus immunotherapy alone, it's not statistically significant. And uh, I'd also just highlight that when we look at the numbers, again, these are Kaplan-Meier curves, which is time moving from left to right. And when there's a gap in the curves, the group on top is doing better. And you can see that the group in orange with chemoimmunotherapy is, is doing modestly better, but they converge over time as these tend to. And the, particularly for overall survival, not a big, big difference. Uh, there's also actually when they looked at subsets, uh, the main finding was the patients who were 75 or older really did not seem to benefit from the combination of chemo to immunotherapy. So uh, right now, today in clinic, this is a judgment that we have with our patients and not a clear, absolute best answer. Uh, and uh, I've had the chance actually to talk a bit with Jerushka about some of these in another setting. And so I'd welcome you, Jerushka, to start with your thoughts of what does this mean to you? I think it's interesting that it's, it's a bit of maybe an eyes in the eyes of the beholder. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, it's interesting in a previous conversation, Jack and I had nearly the opposite interpretation of the same data. Um, so um, I think that really this tells you that um, perhaps the take home message from this is less clear, not to get into the weeds, but um, statistically, um, the, the difference in those is, is 
a numerical difference. When we look at, at, at the actual statistical analysis, um, it, it's, it's not a statistically significant difference. That's usually what, you know, we might hear on the podiums and things like that. And that tells us whether this is something that really we should think, you know, should guide what we do or is something that just sparks, you know, um, our thoughts about it. So in looking at this, my interpretation actually was that, I don't necessarily have to give the chemotherapy or expose a patient to that extra chemotherapy if there is no convincing benefit and that I could in effect to, you know, keep the chemotherapy in my back pocket for if the immunotherapy um, didn't, uh, didn't al allow my patient to benefit alone. But I can see um, the other side of the argument um, that one might feel more comfortable with giving the combination and feeling that we are hitting all of the bases at the same time. So um, uh, I think it probably depends on, on um, opinion and practice pattern, but I think certainly for our, our patients and others who are listening, I think for this particular subset of lung cancer, which we know occurs in about 30% of lung cancers who have this high PD PDR1 expression, I would interpret this as um, a, a, as two very reasonable options. Uh, Gilberto, what do you think? I absolutely agree. A couple of comments in terms of the method. So number one, this is not a comparison that is prospective or what right. we would call a clinical trial. What the uh, Dr. Akimboro, who I actually had the pleasure of interviewing for ASCO Post for a video at ASCO this year, what they did was that they pulled together data that were presented to the FDA. And if you look at it, it's about 2,000 patients or so or thereabouts. We actually did a meta-analysis looking at the same question um, about a year ago, and we could add more patients. We had more studies because we were not restricted to the data that was submitted at the FDA. Again, not a prospective trial. We're doing indirect comparisons. So we always have to take those with a grain of salt. It's not like you really made the study in which way patients really got half of them got um, immunotherapy alone and half of them got chemotherapy as immunotherapy. This is just going back to a trial that was done for a different reason. And in these trials, chemotherapy plus immunotherapy was compared to chemotherapy alone or immunotherapy alone was compared to chemotherapy alone. So this is not like we compare directly immunotherapy versus chemotherapy and immunotherapy. So taking that with a grain of salt, I agree with Dr. Naidu, uh, Jerushka is absolutely right. If you don't see that it's better, why would we use it in terms of overall survival? So I don't believe that this proves that patients live longer if they get chemotherapy and immunotherapy from the beginning. Don't forget, patients will receive chemotherapy later if they receive immunotherapy. The problem is we always have an attrition rate, meaning from one line to the next line, there's always people who cannot get that second therapy that will be coming because they either get too sick or something happens that you don't get there. So uh, those of us who are a little bit older, like Jack and myself, we used to be very uncomfortable about um, waiting for second lines. And we usually uh, wanted to start therapies earlier because we knew that in the past, about 30% of patients would not get to the next line. I don't know that we know what that number is today, but having said that, for patients that do have a lot of symptoms or that have large volume of disease, those are the people that I do prefer to use chemotherapy and immunotherapy. So patients with relatively low volume of disease, older, who are willing um, to go only for immunotherapy, that's usually our preference. If you do have symptoms or if I'm afraid that if we don't get a response from the get-go, and again, we're not necessarily perfect when we do that and we do... Um, make mistakes often, but that's the discussion I usually have with my patients about what the side effects that the chemo will bring and the probable benefit that it brings over the immunotherapy and what you could get with immunotherapy alone. So I think that this is an important discussion, Jack. Yeah, I, I think you've both brought up great points and it's not, it's not like I'm extremely on the side of chemo immunotherapy because in general, my mindset is don't do more than a patient needs to control their disease for the next six or 12 months. Uh, the last thing I would like is for a patient who is destined to have a great response to immunotherapy alone, to be on not just four cycles of chemo they don't need, but then maintenance chemo that's gratuitous when the immunotherapy is doing the heavy lifting. It adds toxicity, it adds side effect, you know, side effects cost. Uh, why do that if you don't need it? On the other hand, uh, 
Gilberto, you raised the concern that we have that we aren't perfect at predicting who's going to fall off the curve. We don't want people to miss that opportunity. I actually see this as a, um, a spectrum uh, where there's room for, uh, for judgment. And I think that uh, I certainly came away from this thinking, when in doubt, I'd err on the side of including the chemo, but, but uh, it depends. If I have somebody who has a small volume of disease, minimal symptoms, plural studying, you know, just a small volume, I'm confident that they could afford to have progression and move on to the next thing without missing a beat. If they have a larger volume of disease, they're losing weight it, as during the initial workup or having escalating pain, uh, I'm going to be more cautious. I'm not going to be as confident that they can afford to have their disease worsen in the first two months without a decline in their performance steps. Another factor that is not included here is that not all of 50% or greater PDL1 is the same, that um, we are getting increasing consistent signals that those patients with highest PDL1 of 90% or higher have an especially high probability of a response versus those with 50 or 60%. 50, 60% is good enough. But if, if uh, I have a patient with a very high PDL1, I'll be even that much more confident in favor of monotherapy with the immune therapy and not wanting to overtreat them there. So you know, I think this has something for everybody, I guess. But you know, the reason here I'm I'm not as much of a stickler about statistical significance is um, when you have two competing options. I think sometimes a, a leaning in one direction might be enough to to count it. But I definitely would say there's no wrong answer here. Any other thoughts on this, sir? So there's one thing that I always like to remind everybody, which is even if you have a PDL one of 80%, 90%, or 100%, but you do have an EGFR mutation or an ALK uh, translocation or red fusion, immunotherapy is not the treatment for you. The correct right. treatment right. in that case is the targeted therapy. So that's important. Even if the PDL one is high, but we have one of those classic driver mutations, we do not want to do immunotherapy. So I think that that's right. important to remind everyone. It doesn't seem to mean the same thing. It's like a fake out in those settings very often. So thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. 